Welcome to breastfeeding class. We're glad that you're here with us today. We are going to talk about some of the benefits of breastfeeding. Uh, there are many. I had a book that had 101 reasons to breastfeed. And I won't promise I won't go through all 101 today or we won't get much else accomplished. Uh, we will talk a bit about getting started and some tips to make breastfeeding go better for you. Uh, and some time with positioning and latching, how to hold the baby when feeding, how to know that the baby is latched on correctly. And a little bit about returning to work as well. Oh, by the way, my name is Dawn Russell. I am one of the lactation consultants here at Mercy Health Hospital on Riverside and I am so glad that you're here. Please, if you have questions after the presentation, um, please feel free to give us a call. I'll put the number on the screen. It is on one of the slides towards the end here, but it is 815-971-5020. If you have any questions, please call one of us. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that babies receive only breast milk for the first six months of their life. And then continuing breastfeeding along with the baby foods, the complementary foods that are given after six months, and continuing for at least a year and beyond as long as desired. Now the World Health Organization and the Academy of Family Practice Physicians all do recommend that um, you go two years. Now I'm not here to say that any of you have to breastfeed for a year or two years, but I just want you to know those are the recommendations. Breastfeeding is the natural biological end to your pregnancy. And it is an important part of the development of your baby. There are many, many benefits, as I mentioned. Um, uh, the antibodies to protect your baby from germs. Uh, your body will produce antibodies specific to the germs that are in your environment. When moms and babies are exposed to germs, then mom is going to put antibodies specific to those germs into her milk. And then the baby's less likely to get sick or as sick as they would if they were not um, breastfeeding. There's less pneumonia, less ear infections, and less diarrhea in babies who are breastfed. It's easy to digest. It's human milk for human babies. It's the extra nutrition and extra ingredients that they need to grow and to thrive. It promotes bonding. There's nothing like holding and cuddling your baby, ladies, and watching your baby grow and know that you're providing everything that baby needs. It's a pretty incredible experience. The first milk, uh, we will talk more about in a bit, called colostrum, coats and prepares the baby's GI tract, the stomach and the intestines, for future feedings. There are some gaps that are between the cells in the infant's stomach and intestines, when they're born, and the colostrum goes in and literally coats all those openings. And that's why there's less allergies in babies who are breastfed, because those, uh, that coating keeps any allergens from getting in there. There is less tooth decay in babies who are breastfed. Uh, even though they don't have teeth yet, they're building good, strong teeth when they're breastfeeding. Uh, there is a significantly less chance of sudden infant death syndrome, which is a very scary thing. Sudden infant death syndrome um, occurs at a much, much lower rate in babies who are breastfed than those who are fed formula. We still don't really know what causes sudden infant death syndrome, but there certainly seems to be some kind of a connection um, to you know, there's other things we're going to ask you to do. The doctors are going to recommend that you put your baby on the back to sleep and things like that. But breastfeeding is also one of the things to prevent SIDS. Also, we guarantee you a smarter child. Now, I'm not telling you you're going to have an honor roll student. I can't promise that. But I will tell you that your child will have a higher IQ than if they're fed formula. 
It protects babies from allergies, as I just mentioned. Asthma, and those kids who do get asthma tend to have a milder case of it. Um, obesity is less common in babies who are breastfed, and that's because babies who are breastfed will stop when they're full. It's so much easier to overfeed with a bottle than it is, at, you can't overfeed at the breast. Uh, so babies learn to stop when they're full, which is something I could have learned <laughs> as a younger person, um, and I would be thinner as well. Uh, there's less diabetes uh, in babies who are breastfed, less arthritis, less childhood cancers, and several intestinal diseases. The breast milk has probiotics and a lot of different immune support, not just the antibodies. There's just tons of different things in the milk that will help babies have a stronger immune system and be much less likely to get sick. And the bowel movements, this is a dad favorite, um, do not have a bad smell when the baby's only getting breast milk. Um, moms like that too, of course. There's benefits to moms to breastfeeding. Um, it's convenient and easy to do once you get the hang of it. Now, um, there are sometimes some challenges uh, that go along with breastfeeding, but we are here to help you and support you. And there's answers to almost everything out there. If you're having some challenges, please let us know. But once you get past, the first couple weeks tend to be the hardest part of breastfeeding. In the first couple weeks, you'll find that um, it gets so much easier after that. It helps you lose the weight you gain during your pregnancy because when you are breastfeeding, your body's making milk and that's burning calories just by making milk. You can burn upwards of four or 500 calories every day just making milk, doing nothing else. It decreases the vaginal bleeding that you do after your babies are born. You're less likely to have a lot of bleeding, so if you're already anemic, you definitely um, will be have, get a lot of benefit from breastfeeding because you won't do as much bleeding to lose any more blood. It's got to do with the hormones. Saves money, another dad favorite, the milk is free. Um, everybody likes free, can't you imagine? Um, Formula is extremely expensive. We are talking anywhere from uh, four or five thousand dollars upwards of ten thousand dollars to feed formula to a newborn for a year. Um, the ten thousand is more the specialty formulas, and the uh, five thousand would six thousand would be standard formula. And if you're not breastfeeding, formula is what's recommended, so you certainly um, can save a lot of money and use that for, for other things. You'll have a healthier baby, so that means that you'll make less trips to the doctor with sick babies and less trips to the pharmacy for medicine for sick babies. Um, there's less of several different types of, of female cancers, uh, particularly breast cancer, ovarian and uterine cancers as well, are less common in babies and moms who breastfeed, excuse me. Uh, there is less high blood pressure even into later life. Um, these are all long-term benefits, less diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, um, and less heart disease, again, throughout life. And there's just a lot of self-confidence that comes with being successful with breastfeeding. There are risks of formula, and really formula should be called artificial baby milk. If they called it that, though, I don't think they'd sell very much of it. Uh, formula is a very scientific name when you think about it. Um, I'm not saying formula is bad. It certainly has its place, um, but it's not the same as breast milk. I think a lot of people think, uh, oh, breastfeeding formula, it's about the same, and it really is not. Um, there are fewer ingredients. Um, last time I checked, a, a bottle of formula had about 25 ingredients in it. Uh, and breast milk has over 400 that we know of now and more are being found right along. So there's definitely not the same thing at all. Every formula manufacturer has had recalls for contaminated formula. And that's been everything from bacteria, viruses, um, metal machine parts, all kinds of things have been found in, in formula. You know, it's a manufactured product. Um, so guess what? Breast milk's never been recalled. 
there's more sickness in babies who are fed formula because they don't have all that immune support that they get from the breast milk. Um, there's more obesity in later life. I was formula fed, so that's my excuse for my fat stomach. Probably eat too much as well, but again, that goes back to not learning when to stop. Um, there is significantly more sudden infant death syndrome in formula fed babies, as I mentioned a minute ago. It's extremely expensive. I just went through that. And there's more waste in landfills, so if you want to save the earth, um, breastfeeding is a good thing to do because there's packaging and processing and all that. Um, that would end up in landfills. So at the hospital, uh, we do what we call rooming in. Rooming in means that moms and babies and dads or other support people can stay together and um, should be together with the baby. Your hospital room is your baby's room. We don't have a traditional nursery anymore. We do have a treatment room. If your baby is having some kind of issues and needs some extra treatment, definitely we can take the baby there. But we would encourage mom or dad or both to come along and stay with the baby as much as possible. Babies feel safer when they're close to their parents and they cry less. Many studies have shown this. And studies show that they breastfeed more often when they're together. And when moms and babies are together, um, like I said, you'll notice when the baby is hungry, you'll feed the baby more often, and you're going to have a better milk supply. Breast milk is made supply and demand. That means when milk is removed, more is made. If you're not removing milk often, especially in those crucial first couple of weeks, you're not going to have as good a milk supply as if you remove milk more often. Every time you breastfeed, you tell your body to make milk, and it will continue to do so. Um, and so your supply will be much, much better. And mothers and babies sleep better. They've done some studies and found out that you're actually going to sleep better with the baby in the room. And in fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending when you get home that baby sleeps in the same room with you. Not in the same bed, but in the same room. Uh, in a crib or a bassinet in, in your room. Uh, and the studies show that they're, you're sleeping better, moms, because, I think, if you wake up and your baby's down the hall in a nursery somewhere, you're going to think, well, I wonder if my baby's okay. I wonder if my baby's crying. I wonder what's going on. But if your baby's right there, you just look over in the bassinet and see the baby and say, oh, baby's asleep. Okay. And you roll over and go back to sleep again. I think that's part of why you get better sleep, because you're close by. Um, and newborns have this extremely strong sense of smell. Newborns know how mother's skin and milk smells because it smells like the amniotic fluid to her. So being close to mom is very comforting to your baby. So an important thing that we want you to do first thing is to hold your baby's skin to skin as soon as possible after the baby's born and for as long as possible, um, at least until the first feeding occurs, which may take an hour or a little bit more before that actually happens. Um, skin to skin means that your baby, undressed of course, is, and, and mom being undressed or dad, um, you hold the baby between your breasts, turn the baby's head to the side, and you put blankets over the back, you kind of lay back yourself and you just relax and cuddle. Um, this is so important for babies. When babies are skin to skin, they stay warmer. Their blood sugars are more stable. They cry less long term. They breastfeed better. Lots of really good things happen when babies are skin to skin. Um, so it's a really important thing to do and it's fun. Even if it was just fun, it would be good to do. But with all those other medical benefits too, it's really important. Um, so lots and lots of time holding your baby directly on your, on your skin is extremely important. For getting a good start with breastfeeding. Not just in the beginning, but it continues. So we would like you to breastfeed as soon as possible after your babies are born. And ideally, if you have a, a natural or vaginal delivery, um, we get that baby skin to skin. That baby will start to feed within the first few minutes or hours, um, or as soon as possible after the birth. We want to get those babies feeding. Um, the sooner you get started, the more milk you're going to make, and the, thing, the better things go. 
Now, um, most newborns are quite alert when they're born. They're alert for the first two to three hours maybe, and they're wide awake and they're alert and they're really interested in learning. And there's something about getting baby feeding in that time that actually imprints on their little brains how to do it and they're gonna do better later on. Um, keep the baby with you. We talked about the rooming in and about keeping the baby in your room with you. But keep staying close to the baby is really important. And we also ask that you avoid artificial nipples in the beginning. Artificial nipples are things like pacifiers or baby bottles. And if you're um, using a pacifier in the beginning, it can interfere with how baby learns to breastfeed and hides hunger cues and such. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, you want to feed the baby whenever the baby shows hunger cues. We don't schedule feedings anymore. Uh, truly, for formula-fed or breastfed babies, scheduling feedings is kind of old, old thought. Um, babies know when they're hungry, and they're going to be able to show you when they're hungry, and we'll talk about how you know that. But you also want to keep a count of feedings because you want to be sure babies are getting 8 to 12 feedings at least every 24 hours. If your baby isn't feeding eight times an hour, or in a day, excuse me, I want you to give us a call. And the nurses can help you latch your babies and learn some different feeding positions. We're going to do some practice uh, with the doll here, um, but you want, when you have an actual baby, you need some help. So uh, feel free to ask the nurses to help you breastfeed and have them show you some different positions because when you know more different kinds of positions then you're going to um, have some options when you get home. Maybe baby doesn't latch in one position, might latch in a different one, so you want to try to do that. Um, low as many as you can. Now if you do need a c-section that is not an emergency, um, we can put the baby skin to skin in the first couple of minutes. Usually the Neonatal intensive care doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists take a quick look at the baby, then they'll put the baby on you. Um, most C-sections are done with you very numb um, but awake. So you can hold that baby. Nothing's going to get your mind off C-section better than having your baby right there to look at and starting that skin-to-skin -skin process. Now, we don't really expect the baby to latch on in the operating room, but occasionally they have. But most of the time, uh, once you get to recovery room is when that first feeding will, will begin. Now, medications that we give, we, not me personally, but that are given during labor can have a little bit of a impact on how breastfeeding goes in the first couple of days. Um, medications that are given to induce labor, to speed labor, uh, even all the IV fluids that are given while you're in labor can cause a little bit of a delay in babies figuring out how to uh, breastfeed, as epidurals as well. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't have an epidural, I'm just saying that if you do, sometimes you may need to be a little more patient with your baby and so that your baby will learn um, to breastfeed. You just have to hold them skin to skin, him or her, and lots and lots of patience uh, because the baby will, will eventually feed for you. And that skin to skin contact I've been talking about does continue past that first hour that we call the golden hour when babies are on moms. And if, by the way, if for some reason mom's unable to do it, dads can hold baby skin to skin in the first hour as well. And we want both parents to be holding baby skin to skin as much as possible for the first several months of your baby's life. Um, that skin to skin contact does continue to provide a lot of support for your baby. So how do you know that your baby is hungry? What kind of things are you going to see that is going to tell you that your baby is hungry? Well, these are important things that I really want you to understand because babies are very capable of telling you when they're hungry. Now, they can't say it in words yet because they don't talk, but they will in how they act. Now, uh, babies may just get wiggly and squirmy. Um, they may go <laughs> and squiggle and worm around, squirm around. That's quite common. Um, that's a sign that your baby is waking and getting ready to feed. 
Uh, crying is the last sign of hunger. You don't want to wait for your baby to cry to feed because once a newborn starts crying, they just get so worked up that they lose it and they can't calm down and get um, a good latch and, and a good feeding. Latch is how babies attach to the breast. So babies will um, suck on their fingers or their fists or their thumbs. They will put their hands by their mouth and that's another sign that they're hungry. Sucking mouth movements, like the babies will mm, 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 kind of make these little sucking motions. It's quiet, but it's definitely obvious that um, they're screaming, I'm hungry, to you, and they want to be fed. Um, when you pick your baby up, if the baby turns their head towards your chest, and, and that includes dad and other caregivers, uh, family members, if the baby, when you pick the baby up, the baby buries their head in your chest, they're telling you that they're hungry. Hand baby to mom. Uh, when you're holding the baby skin to skin, the babies will actually bob their head on your chest, kind of like a little woodpecker. You'll see them just bang, bang, bang and across your chest. That's a sign that the baby is hungry. That baby is showing you um, that they're trying to find the breast. Now when you see the baby doing any of these things, you want to pick the baby up and feed the baby as soon as possible. Because if you don't, uh, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to start screaming, and then you have to calm them down before they're going to breastfeed, or they may go back to sleep. Especially an early baby might go back to sleep and then miss a feeding. And when you miss feedings, you're missing opportunities to get that milk supply built up. So it can, may impact your milk supply. It may impact how babies are feeding and their weight loss and gain. By the way, all newborns lose weight for the first few days of their life. They will start gaining um, usually by the fifth day or so and should be back to birth weight by about 10 days to 14 days of age. Now the size of your breast has absolutely nothing to do with your ability to breastfeed. Women with large breasts, women with small breasts all have pretty much the same milk making capacity. The type of nipple varies. Um, men are a little more aware of this than women typically. But um, some women have nipples that stick out a lot, or, or some just a little, and some don't stick out at all, uh, ever. Some stick out some of the time and not other times. There are women with large nipples, women with small nipples. Nipples vary a lot from person to person. Um, babies can learn to breastfeed on any kind of nipple. Think about it. Up till about 100 years ago, there wasn't a good choice. Your baby breastfed or they died. So considering we're all here tells me that our ancestors figured it out, so I think our babies can too. So we'll work with you if you're having any issue with getting the baby to latch. The areola, or the areola, is the dark area around the nipple, and that is, has probably gotten darker if it's your first pregnancy, during your pregnancy. Um, that's gonna be important when we're talking about latching, because the baby doesn't latch to the nipple, the baby needs to latch onto the breast itself, um, and onto that areola. And areolas come in different sizes. Some are very small, some are very big. Again, doesn't matter. Just so the baby is latching onto the breast itself and not just the nipple. The milk producing cells are all throughout the breast. They're not blue like this, of course. That's just for the pictures. But um, each of those little things that looks like a grape is a cluster of cells that will make milk. The centers are hollow. When they make the milk, the milk goes into the center of each of those. And these things that look like stems, those are ducts, D-U-C-T-S, which is a hollow tube that carries the milk to the nipple openings. And yes, there's more than one. Uh, probably five, seven, nine openings in each breast, typically. Um, each one is draining a different portion of the breast. So. When the baby is latched on or attached to the breast properly and is sucking properly, the message goes to your brain, ladies, that somebody's looking for food and you need to make milk. So the brains release hormones that tell your body to make milk and for that milk to come out. So the more you're feeding, the more milk will be produced and more milk and more milk and more milk, which is really what you want. Uh, to improve that, you have a good milk supply once um, the mature milk comes in. 
Now the first milk is called colostrum. Colostrum is very thick and sticky for lack of a better word. Um, the picture on the top here is uh, quite a bit of colostrum. You can see by the size of the fingers there that that's not a very large container that's in the picture. Colostrum may be a creamy yellow like that or it may be a clear yellow. Doesn't matter. Some women have some leaking of colostrum before the baby's born. Colostrum's made by the 20th week of pregnancy and is waiting for your baby to be born. So there's food right with that first feeding. Colostrum has some extra things that newborns need. Like I said, it coats the stomach and intestines. I had mentioned that earlier. And it's got extra, the antibodies, extra things that babies need. Because your babies are literally floating around in a bubble right now. Uh, once they're born, they're out here in the world where there are germs. And with this flu season, we especially want to be sure that babies are getting breast milk. Um, then, for the first, the classroom's produced before the baby's born and for about three to five days after the baby's born. And then it starts changing over to more what we call transitional milk. Transitional milk is a combination of colostrum and mature breast milk. And the first week, that's about what the baby's going to be getting. But it's whiter and in more larger quantity. It should be in by day five. You want to feel some changes in your breast by day five. Um, and the size of the baby's stomach at birth, I don't know if you can see this, this little tiny white ball is the size of a newborn's stomach at birth, a full-term baby. It holds about a teaspoon or two. The colostrum is very thick and concentrated. So the baby hat, but the baby has to suck and suck and suck and suck and suck and suck and swallow. Suck and suck and suck and suck and suck and suck and swallow. So it takes the baby a while to get that teaspoon or two of milk to fill their little stomach at birth. Then as it starts changing over to the mature milk, the transitional milk, then it'll be the size of this pink ping pong ball. And that will hold maybe an ounce, um, up to uh, between a half ounce and an ounce. Uh, so that definitely is a big change in just a few days from the little white stomach size to the big pink ball. Somewhere around day 10 to two weeks, the mature milk is in pretty fully and the baby stomach will be the size of this orange egg. And that is, uh, holds maybe two ounces. Um, and so babies don't need a lot of extra they certainly don't need extra water. There's plenty of water in the breast milk. All the baby needs is breast milk, and it changes just as baby stomachs change. The mature milk is more plentiful, but just as nutritious as the colostrum. This is just another way to look at the newborn stomach size. This one says day one, the size of a cherry, which is pretty close to the size of that little white ball I just showed. Day three, the size of a walnut. Day seven, the size of an apricot, and one month, the size of an egg, a large egg, and it shows along there, the bottles behind, how much milk that little stomach can hold. So baby doesn't need extra. Baby gets everything they need if they're getting, you know, sucking actively and getting colostrum. So the breast milk changes, once it's all mature breast milk, it changes throughout the feeding. The milk on the left here was pumped at the beginning of a pumping session. The milk on the right at the end. The milk on the left looks to me like skim milk. And the milk on the right looks more like cream. And so at the beginning of the feeding, there is more water. Okay, got that in the next slide. But it's still got plenty of other nutrients as well, but the water is to satisfy your baby's thirst. And then as the baby feeds, it gradually changes over to higher fat milk. The longer the baby feeds, generally the higher the fats are in the milk. And the fats are important for brain development, they're important for growth, and they're important for staying satisfied between feedings. So we want to be sure that um, the baby feeds as long as possible on the first breast, and then burp them and offer the second breast. So feedings that are close together might have higher fats because 
the fats cling to the inside of the ducts and will be um, in the feedings more uh, if they're close together. You'll have more fats. So as I mentioned earlier, breast milk contains over 400 nutrients. Um, and there's more being found right along. So on the right, the column on the right shows, you know, some of the things. The antibodies, the hormones, the antivirals, the anti-allergens, the anti-parasites, the growth factors, the enzymes, the minerals, the vitamins, the fats, and the carbohydrates and proteins. And then on the left is what's in formula. Um, but there are probiotics in the milk. You hear a lot about probiotics now. Um, again, part of the immunity stuff that's in that breast milk. Um, there are hormones and growth factors. There's the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's a mouthful. Those are the fats that are in the milk further into the feeding. Those are very important for brain development, for growth, and for staying satisfied between feedings. So don't let anyone tell you that you stop feeding on one breast after so many minutes and feed on the other breast. Let that baby finish that first breast as much as possible, then burp and offer the second breast. The important thing to understand though is that the breast milk changes. Every feeding, every day, it's going to be different for your baby. It's going to be exactly what your baby needs, exactly when your baby needs it. I call it designer breast milk because every woman makes just what her baby needs. And like I said, every feeding is different. So we are also delaying the baths for our newborns. Um, years ago we used to, you know, after you saw the baby for a few minutes, rush to the nursery to give the baby a bath. Now we're finding that that can interfere with breastfeeding as well as baby's transition to this new life outside of the uterus. So we hold off on the baths at least six hours and up to 24 hours or more if needed. Um, we want to be sure babies are breastfeeding well, have had a couple of good feedings before we do the bath. Now I mentioned earlier that for the first couple hours babies are quite alert. After that, sometimes they get kind of sleepy. And then you're struggling getting the baby to wake up. Um, but that usually only lasts about 24 hours and then they perk up again. But um, holding off on that bath is fine. So if someone comes to your room and says, I want to do the baby's bath, say, yeah, let's wait. I don't think baby's feeding really well yet. And that's perfectly fine to do, OK? Um, now, we'll have wiped all the gooky stuff off, but I'm talking the soap and water bath, of course. So I want to go through some things about positioning a little bit with you. Um, so I'm going to sit down here and I have a baby doll. And if any of you have a doll or a stuffed animal or anything like that, um, I would recommend that you pause this and that you go get it. Because um, doing this along with me may help you um, learn. When we do in-person classes, we have dolls for everybody, and um, we have everybody practice together. Now, um, it's important that, ladies, that you are supported and that you are comfortable. Um, you don't want to be hunching over the baby to feed. I, once in a while, will come into a room and find a mom all hunched over a baby like this feeding. You know, she's going to get a sore neck and sore back and sore shoulders. This isn't going to be very much fun anymore. Babies are light and portable. Bring your baby to your breast. Do not bring your breast to your baby. Um, there's no one right way to hold the baby, but there are a couple that are not so good. Um, you want to be sure the baby is facing you. The baby's tummy and chest are up against mom. If the baby's laying like this and you're feeding, the poor child has to crick their neck around to eat. And I don't know about you, but I think it'd be pretty hard to swallow if your head was twisted all the way around. So instead, you want to turn the baby. Be sure the baby is facing you. OK. Um, now, one arm should be down and one arm should be up um, so that the chest and belly can be up against you. Definitely unwrap blankets. If you have a baby who's very, very sleepy, um, undress them. 
and just to their diaper and try to feed them with some skin-to-skin -skin contact. That can often keep them more awake. So we want to put the baby facing you and the cradle hold, which is the picture on the left up there, is a very popular position for feeding. I find, however, that with newborns it doesn't work very well. I find that most of the time when I'm called into a room because a mom has sore nipples, I ask her how she's holding the baby, it's almost always like this. Now once your baby's learned how to breastfeed, this will be a fine and wonderful position to use. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now because I want you to learn the positions that work better with newborns for right now. So instead of having the baby in the crook of your arm, you're going to switch hands and you're going to bring this arm up, hold the baby low behind the ears. Again, one arm down, one arm up. Baby's chest and belly up against you. And if you have large breasts especially, you may need to support your breast from underneath in kind of a U-shaped fashion like this. Um, another trick is to line the baby's nose, if I was your baby and this was your nipple, line the baby's nose up with the nipple before you begin. Because when you do that and you tickle this area of the baby between the nose and the mouth with your nipple, then the baby is going to open wide and they're going to get on nice and deep and their nose won't be buried. If you line the nipple up with their mouth, then when they open, their nose gets buried in the breast and they can't breathe. And if they can't breathe, they can't eat. And remember I told you about those little tubes that carry the, nip, the milk to the nipple openings. Those are, some of them are right under the skin. So if you are pushing on your breast to make a breathing space for your baby, you are blocking some of that flow of milk. So you don't want to do that. So line the nose up with the nipple. You're going to tickle this area when the baby opens wide. Pull the baby in closely. Now I don't want you holding the back of baby's head. If you hold the back of your baby's head, it pushes the nose in the breast and it also makes your baby want to pull back. Think about it. If you were eating and I walked up behind you and shoved your head into the food, pretty sure you'd push back. And that's just what babies do. So we want to instead slide your hand down, hold the baby low behind the ears. Now these, this baby doll has a pretty floppy head just like your baby will, but you have good support with your fingertips low behind the ears and you don't make the baby feel like they're being pressed onto the breast, okay? Now a pillow in your lap, some people use a boppy, there's breastfeeding pillows, something to support your baby's weight because even a seven pound baby gets pretty heavy after a while and some of those early feedings will last 45 minutes or even an hour sometimes. So you want to be sure you have something to support the baby in your lap. Now one other sign uh, thing, remember I said that sucking on their fingers is a hunger cue. So if you're trying to get your baby to breastfeed and your baby is sticking their hand in front of their mouths or into their mouths, they can't latch on properly. So this is where having another support person, dad or another support person available, hold that hand for a minute while baby gets latched on and then you can let go of it. Uh, once ba baby's feeding, then th that hand isn't going to be an issue. The, lower, the hand below the baby usually is pretty good. It's this one here that's going to get in the way for you. So you have seen hunger cues in your baby. You've picked your baby up. You've unwrapped the blankets. Because if baby's all wrapped up and their arms are here, they can't get close enough to get a good deep latch. So we want those arms out of the way. So essentially the baby should be like this. Arms on either side of the breast and chin pressing into the breast for them to latch on properly. So we've lined the nose up to the nipple. We tickle. Wait for the wide open mouth. You can move your breast or move your baby. I don't care which. Pull the baby chin first and then upper lip second and pull the baby in close. Now you have to put some serious pressure on the shoulders and upper back this way. You really need to push um, in order to keep some good support there. And then the baby will start with some rapid sucking and then we'll start doing long slow draws and when the baby's jaw is moving up and down and up and down that's when they're actually moving milk. If they're just doing little quiver sucks they're not probably getting any milk. So you want to watch for that. The baby's lips should be flared out like a little fish. Top lip and bottom should be flared out 
the baby's mouth should be very, very wide before you pull the baby in. And their cheeks should be puffy. You can see my baby's cheek here is pretty puffy. You want to keep those, those cheeks should stay puffy. If they're sunken in or you're hearing clicking or smacking when the baby's feeding, there's some issues we need to help you with, so please give us a call. Um, or call the nurse and ask for some help. So you've tickled, you've waited for the wide open mouth, you've pulled the baby in close, and then you're putting some pressure on the baby's shoulders and upper back. It helps babies feel stable and secure, and it helps them keep feeding well and staying on the breast. Again, the baby is on the breast, not just the nipple. That's how the baby is going to get food. I have a little um, breast here. So baby should be on here, not on the nipple. Pulling on the nipple just hurts and doesn't do anything. But getting behind it is what baby's jaw movement and tongue movement is going to, and sucking is going to actually get the milk out. So this is called the cross cradle. It's the position in the middle picture up there. And it's a great one to use with newborns. Um, keep the baby feeding as, as long as possible. Sometimes they doze off in the first couple days, so you might need to tickle them, wiggle them. Uh, another good job for dads is tickling the bottom of baby's feet. Um, every baby seems to have something that will keep them sucking actively. Um, if you do have larger breasts, you do want to keep some support on that breast throughout the feeding. Because if you let go, the breast may shift and pull out of baby's mouth a bit. Baby can latch on good, but not stay latched on and end up on the nipple. So you, if it starts to hurt a lot, you need to stop the baby and not let the baby keep going. Now, the first couple sucks, sometimes are a bit of an ooh, but should get better in a cup within 20, 30 seconds. If it's still hurting, I don't want you to let keep going with the feeding. I want you to stop and try again, get the baby latched on better. So, never just pull a sucking baby off your breast, guaranteed to make you sore, ladies. Um, instead, take a finger that hopefully has shorter nails on it. You're going to get between the baby's lips and mouth and wiggle in there until the baby releases the suction. Then take the baby off and try again to get a deeper latch. And again, keep some pressure here on the shoulders, really important. You're not hurting the baby, you need to push pretty hard on the baby's shoulders and upper back. As long as you can keep the baby feeding, let the baby keep going. That's why you have to be in a comfortable position that you can hold for a while. Then when the baby stops, let's go, falls asleep, whatever, and you can't get them awake again, then you're going to want to burp the baby. Now, your breast isn't full of air like a bottle, so you may, your baby may or may not burp, but it's always good to try for a couple of minutes, probably. And then we're going to try the other breast. Now, one breast is always going to be a little more awkward than the other. Uh, awkward's my new word for what holding babies like this is, but it gets better. Um, right and left-handedness plays a role in, in which side's going to be more comfortable for you. But I want you to try both breasts at every feeding. Always offer both. Um, I call the first breast the main meal and the second breast dessert. Sometimes your baby's going to want dessert and sometimes not, but you want to at least offer it every time. So this time again, baby's tummy and chest against me, arms on either side of the breast, holding low behind the ears, not on the back of the head, tickling, waiting for that wide open mouth, pulling the baby in close and quick, and watching that baby do the long, slow draws. You may even see their ears wiggle when they're sucking properly. It should not be terribly painful though. If it is, please call for help. There might be some issue with the anatomy or something that we should be looking at. So that's called the cross cradle. The picture on the right is the football hold. Football hold's another good one to use um, and using different feeding positions throughout the day in the beginning especially is going to prevent some soreness. I'd rather prevent soreness than have to treat it. In the football hold, you're holding the baby kind of similar to the cross cradle, but you're going to slide the baby around your side. So you will need some pillows or something next to you to support your baby. And again, an arm on either side, chest and belly up against. Tickle, wait for the wide open mouth, pull the baby in close and quick. 
and you can sometimes see the baby feeding a little better in this position. Sometimes moms who have C-sections find this a little more comfortable because there's no weight of the baby on their stomach. Um, this is a great way to feed newborns. They often will latch nicely in this position. Um, again, called the football or the clutch hold. And then when the baby stops, you can't get the baby to feed anymore, you're gonna burp again and you're going to offer the other breast. So again, now you're going to have to put some things, uh, pillows or something to support baby on the side. If you're using a boppy, you want to rotate the boppy around so that the opening is on the side opposite where baby is, so there's good support for baby's legs back here. You may need a pillow behind your back to move you a little further forward so there are room if you have a long baby for those feet back there. So again, holding low behind the ears and baby unwrapped. One arm down, one arm up, tickle, wait for the wide open mouth, pull the baby in close and quick for feeding. This is football hold. Okay. Now, I have some news. You don't have to sit up to breastfeed. How about that? You can actually lay down when you're breastfeeding. So that's another great way, especially in the beginning. Um, honestly, ladies, when you have a, a normal vaginal delivery, your bottom may be a little sore and sitting up may not be the most comfortable position for you. So some of these laying down positions are great. Um, the laid back is my favorite. That's the one shown here. And it starts with the baby being skin to skin with you. Again, pretend that we're not wearing clothes. Um, with the baby's head in the middle and you just cuddle and put a blanket over the baby and just cuddle that baby. If your baby is not latching well, I definitely recommend you try this laid back breastfeeding position. Um, you just hold the baby for a while and it might take 45 minutes or an hour for the baby to latch on. But the baby at some point will start banging their head and will kind of start lunging. So you have to hold the baby under the arms a little easier than having to try and figure out those other holds. And when the baby starts l lunging towards one breast or another, you just kind of support them over there. And what the baby's going to do is shake their head. Your baby can lift their head, but not for very long because it's pretty large for the size of their body. But they um, can lift it just a little bit. And when you're laying back and they figure out, they're feeling with their face, where is, again, if I was your baby and this is your nipple, they're feeling for the nipple. When they figure out where it is, they lift their head, they come down, and they get a good deep latch. Many times when babies aren't feeding well, this is the best thing to try. So I definitely want you to um, consider using this position early on. And you're laying, your head should be up, oh, about 30 degrees maybe. You should have pillows behind your head so that you can see the baby because if you're looking at the ceiling, you don't know what the baby's doing. Um, but you don't want to hold your head up either or you're going to get a sore neck. So pillows behind your neck. And again, you just have to hold the baby's body. If you find when the baby latches on that their nose is buried, just putting a little pressure on the shoulder will pop that nose right out. Um, and then the baby will be able to breathe. So you want to be sure the baby's breathing when they're eating. And you want to watch for sucking, and you want to hear swallowing. When your baby is feeding, you shouldn't hear a lot of noise, but every little while you might hear a little ka sound, or uh, you may see the baby swallow under the chin there. Um, swallowing is important. Now the baby's going to suck and suck and suck and suck and suck and then swallow and suck and suck and suck and suck and swallow. But you want to be sure um, that you're hearing some swallowing. With colostrum, you have to really listen for it. Once the mature milk is in, you start hearing swallowing a little easier. But this is the laid back position. And so you're, you're laying back and baby's fully supported on your body. Now if you do have a C-section, you don't want the baby kicking right here. So then you might want to put the baby a little more to the side like this. Any position is fine. Um, anywhere on your body. But start with the baby kind of vertical here. If the baby's still hungry after that, then you can go put the baby to the other side. But babies actually go through nine steps to kind of self-latch. This is called baby-led feeding, this laid back. Um, babies are using their own um, instincts 
and they, as I say, latch right on and many times more comfortable than when you're sitting up. So it's certainly worth a try. I recommend this one a lot. The other laying down one is the side lying. And again, I'm not going to get on the floor, but um, you lay on your side and you lay the baby next to you. And you keep your hand on the shoulders and upper back of the baby. Tickle when the baby opens wide, you're going to pull the baby in close. And that way you can rest if you have pillows under your head, uh, behind your back, between your legs, wherever it's going to be most comfortable for you. And the baby can feed. Just one caution with this position or any feeding position, you don't want to be feeding a baby on a sofa um, when you're sleepy because the baby can slide down between the cushions and could suffocate. So if you're, you're really safer to do it on a firm surface on your bed or something like that if you have a firm mattress. Um, sometimes when I was breastfeeding my kids, by the way, I have two children, uh, breastfed each of them 14 months. Um, and I would sometimes lay a blanket on the floor and a pillow for me, and I'd lay on the floor with the baby because I figured I can't drop the baby <laughs> when we're already on the floor. Um, for side lying position, that works really well too. So I want to review a little bit about the positions. Again, this shows the laid back. And she's on a sofa, but you can see it's daylight and she's awake. Um, you may need to undress your babies for laid back, or you may not. Um, and babies latch with very little help in this position. So here are some people actually doing more skin to skin with their babies and waiting for those babies' cues to, to go on. Baby should be tummy to tummy to you. I've said that over and over, but it's just really important. Whatever position you're using, the baby's tummy should be against your body. Um, touching. And if you've got a sleepy baby, again, skin to skin, contact will really help. You line the nose up with the nipple, as I mentioned. Tickle that upper lip area. When the baby opens wide, pull the baby in close and quick. The chin should always be touching the breast and the nose should be near to breathe. And then listen or watch for the swallows, as I said. This animation is from kellymom.com. By the way, um, it's an excellent website. It is an international board certified lactation consultant like myself that puts that out. And, and she's got a wonderful website. I really recommend that you watch some of her stuff. But this is just a really nice way to um, see what I mean about lining the nose up with the nipple, the chin touches first, then the upper lip. And you see how the baby has more than just the nipple in the mouth, has some of the colored area around in the mouth, because that's going to be a good, comfortable latch. All right. This was still on her website last time I looked, which was a month or two ago. OK, again, this is a well-latched baby. The chin is touching the breast. The mouth is very wide open. The lips are not curled in. Uh, you may see more of the areola by the nose than by the chin, depending on the size of it. Uh, the cheeks are full and the lips are flared out. So when a baby is latched on properly, um, this is the nipple way back in the baby's mouth. And the tongue comes over. This is where the baby's bottom teeth are going to come out. So it looks like we've taken it and pulled on it. But truly, this is much more comfortable. And the reason is the baby has a hard palate. The roof of the mouth is hard in the front. But further back, it's softer. So you want the nipple in that soft palate area, which is exactly where it's going to go if you line the nose up with the nipple beforehand. Uh, sometimes you'll see the tongue at the corner of the mouth, sometimes you don't. But definitely the tongue has to be over those lower gum for the baby to uh, feed properly. Now this animation, the chin isn't touching the breast like it should, but I like the animation because it shows where that tongue is and how the tongue actually comes up and down, up and down as the baby is sucking. And that jaw movement that you see and the milk just going right down into baby's stomach. Okay. 
hand expression is something I want to talk about next. Hand expression means getting milk out of the breast using your hands instead of a pump or a baby. Hand expression is useful in a lot of different situations. Sometimes we will have you use that here in the hospital if your baby isn't latching very well. Now a full-term baby can, um, we give them 24 hours to get a good latch. We give them a little more time. If your baby's 39, 40 weeks, we're going to be kind of patient with your baby as your baby figures this out. If your baby's early, like a thir 37 weeks or 36 weeks, you definitely want to have, um, you know, within 12 hours see that baby feeding. Otherwise, you know, we're going to start having you express some milk. Now, um, to get milk out of the breast, especially colostrum, because colostrum's thicker and a little hard to get out with a breast pump. We may use one, but don't expect to get a whole lot in the first couple days with a breast pump. Um, to do, because uh, hand expression, you're going to put your thumb on one side of the breast, fingers on the other. Now I'm not on the nipple itself. I am uh, behind there. You're going to push in towards your back. You're going to squeeze gently and let go. Push in and squeeze. Push in and squeeze. Do that for 30 seconds or a minute and then go to another position, 30 seconds or a minute, push and squeeze, push and squeeze, push and squeeze. And then go to the other breast, push and squeeze, push and squeeze. And then some another position there. And going back and forth a few times, uh, we'll get some milk out. Now in the picture you see the lady holding a plastic spoon. We have little plastic spoons we'll give you. You can hand express a little bit onto that spoon um, and then the baby will lick it right off the spoon. Uh, remember I said a teaspoon's of feeding in the first day or two. So in the first day or two, if you can get a couple half teaspoons out on a spoon and we give it to your baby, baby's been fed, we can move on to the next feeding. Sometimes just doing that once or twice will get babies perked up and ready to feed better, get some calories into them. Uh, sometimes they um, don't always uh, perk up and then we have you continue to pump and, and get some milk out. So hand expression is useful in the first couple days if we have babies that aren't feeding well. It's also useful later on. Maybe at some point you are away from your baby longer than you expected to be and you didn't bring your breast pump. Well, if you didn't, you always have your hands. So when your breasts start filling up and getting over full, you want to get that milk out. So you're going to, you could go in like to a bathroom and express it into the sink. Now, the um, colostrum just comes out and drops. Mature milk's actually going to spray, and sometimes a good distance. So if you're going to catch um, mature milk, you want to be sure you have kind of a wide mouth container to do so. But that would be a good time to use something like that. Now, sometimes if you are pumping milk, some hand expression and pumping together will help you get more milk as well. So that's hand expression. Breastfeeding gets easier. I can't stress enough that the hardest part of breastfeeding is those first couple of weeks. Um, you, under, you have to understand that you're learning, your baby's learning, you're learning together. Be patient. Um, all babies can, can breastfeed. And hold the baby skin to skin a lot in between feedings is going to help your babies get ready to feed better. If you have an early better baby, they're going to feed better the closer they get to their due dates. Now dads are an important part of breastfeeding as well. Uh, breastfeeding may seem kind of like mom's job. Well, it is, but dad support is extremely important too. So hopefully uh, we have some dads watching as well. Um, dads, you play an important part in supporting mom and, and helping her and making sure that you have a healthy partner as well as baby in the long run from the breastfeeding. But there's important things you need to do with the baby as well. Um, cuddle and hold that baby skin to skin every day for a while. Talk or sing to your baby. Your baby doesn't know if you sing well. You can sing to your baby whether or not you're a good singer. Help with the baths. Read to the baby. And I don't care if you read the Wall Street Journal or Sports Illustrated to your baby in those first few days. It doesn't matter. Um, eventually some little baby books might be uh, fun. But um, 
the baby needs to hear your voice, the baby needs to be close to you and bond with you as well. You can take walks with the baby, take, give mom a break in between feedings so she can shower or eat or something. Um, most importantly, support mom. Tell her she's doing a good job means the world to her. Now earlier I mentioned to avoid bottle feeding. And we recommend no bottles unless there's a medical reason to give a bottle. And that would mean your doctor or one of us tells you that you have to give a bottle to your baby. Um, when a baby's feeding from a bottle, their, if this was the bottle, their tongue will come up and actually block off the flow of milk. It comes so fast, even from a slow flow nipple, the milk's going to flow. Uh, and we, the baby learns to control that flow by blocking off, by pulling the tongue back. And remember I said with breastfeeding, the tongue needs to be forward. So sometimes just one bottle and we're struggling with getting babies to pull that tongue back down. Um, we have to do some tongue exercises and such to get them to latch better. Um, it's almost effortless and I've seen some babies think, oh that was pretty easy, you know, and, and then struggle at the breast and get fussy because it doesn't come as fast at the breast. So it can interfere with how the baby learns to latch on and it can interfere with milk supply because if you're giving a bottle a formula or something instead of breastfeeding, your body doesn't know to keep making milk. So you want to be sure that you're uh, feeding often in the beginning and avoid those bottles. Now, if your baby does need some food in the beginning, I already mentioned the spoon feeding, which is shown in the middle here. Um, with a little bit of colostrum. If you get a little bit more, we have some special uh, feeding syringes with a little tube on the end, and you put your clean finger in the baby's mouth, let the baby suck, slide that tube alongside, and the baby will suck it right out of the syringe. It's pretty amazing to see. Um, you don't want to be shoving it in and choking them, but little larger amounts will sometimes do what we call finger feeding with the syringe. Um, cup feeding is another option. Now, a lot of people look at me like I have two heads when I say you can cup feed a newborn, but you really can. Um, parts of the world do a lot of cup feeding of new babies. When cup feeding, you want to be sure that you do have baby's arms swaddle down because babies swing their arms around, and if they hit that cup, it's going to go flying and it's going to spill, and if it's got breast milk in it, you are not going to be happy. So you want to swaddle their arms down, sit them upright, hold the cup to their lower lip, and babies will bring their tongues out and just kind of lap it right out of there. It's pretty amazing uh, to see a baby cup feed, but they can. Um, YouTube has a couple good videos. YouTube, go on YouTube and search cup feeding newborn and you'll see some good ones. I also said to avoid pacifiers in the first four weeks. So you want to um, have the baby learning at the breast. All the sucking should be done at the breast. And remember, sucking is a hunger cue. So if your baby is sucking away on a pacifier, they're telling you they're hungry and they need to eat. Um, they're growing at an amazing rate and they need that food at least eight to 12 times every day. Um, and it, so it can cause a lower milk supply because you might miss some feedings while baby's sucking away on the pacifier and again, can contribute to latch problems because it, it doesn't feel like the nipple to the baby. Tummy time is important and actually relating to breastfeeding. You may have learned about tummy time from some of the other classes if you've been uh, watching other classes. Um, tummy time is part of baby's jaw development and neck and jaw development and will impact breastfeeding as well. You want to start doing some tummy time with your baby right from the start, right from the first week. Um, now when you're laying back and you have your baby skin to skin on you, you're actually doing some kind of starting of tummy time that way. You want to keep baby off the back of the head because they sleep on the backs of their heads and some babies are getting flat heads. So one reason to do tummy time is to get them off the back of their heads, hold them up or put them on their tummies when you're awake and watching. Um, most babies don't like it at first. They're going to get fussy, but eventually we'll learn to push themselves up. And you want to do that only when you're awake and watching them. And 
aim for 30 minutes a day, you won't get that in the first couple of weeks, but you should, hopefully you'll get to that point. And it's going to improve your baby's motor skills, strength, their shoulders, their arms, when they learn to push themselves up and hold that neck up. And it's got to do with their jaw development as well. So get down on the floor with the baby. She's got a little mirror, you know, rattles on either side of the baby so you get the baby to turn their head when they're down there. Really important. So the next thing I want to talk about is how do you know the baby is getting enough milk? This is a common worry amongst a lot of the moms that I've um, worked with because you can't see how much milk the baby's getting. There are no ounce markers on your breast telling how much milk the baby's getting. And in the colostrum phase, your breasts aren't even going to feel any different before and after feedings because remember, a teaspoon you're not going to feel in your whole breast. But once the mature milk's in and baby's taking an ounce or more, um, your breasts should feel firm before feedings and softer after. That's one of the ways you're going to know. Um, in the beginning, we go by watching the baby's wet and poopy diapers because if nothing goes in, nothing comes out the other end. And the colostrum has a bit of a laxative effect. So when babies are having lots of poops, I'm really happy because I know that they've gotten some colostrum. In the first 24 hours, we want to see your baby have at least one wet and at least one bowel movement in the first 24 hours. They can have more, but that's a minimum. Second day, we want to see two wets and two poops in the second 24 hours. Third day, we want to see three wets and three poopy diapers. Fourth day, we want to see four wets and four poopy diapers. Um, by the fifth day, ideally your mature milk will be in, your breasts will be feeling full, warm, or heavy. That's one of the ways you know the milk's there, and you're going to start hearing babies swallowing a whole lot more. Um, and then five or six wets and three to four bowel movements may continue. Now some babies have bowel movements after every feeding, and they'll have eight or ten in a day. Some will have three or four. But you would see there's not a single day where there's been no bowel movements on this list so far. On day six to six weeks or so, six to eight heavy wet diapers. Now those first wet diapers in the beginning aren't going to be really heavy because the colostrum doesn't have a lot of water in it. But once the mature milk's in and baby's getting more liquids, then they're going to have heavier wet diapers and there'll be no doubt in your mind that they're wet. A lot of the disposable diapers have a little yellow line that will turn to blue when the baby is wet. Um, so that's a good way in the beginning especially. And continuing the bowel movements every day till around five or six weeks. And in that, at that point, some babies will have fewer bowel movements. I am okay with a six-week-old baby not having a bowel movement every day. I'm not okay with a six-day-old baby not having a bowel movement because they should still be having them. Um, if your baby's not having the poopy diapers, I want you to call us. Okay. But like I said, after six weeks, fewer bowel movements sometimes will occur. Not have one every day. They just absorb all of the food. Oops, what'd I do? Uh-oh. There we go. Okay. Now, as far as your baby's uh, poopy diapers, they're going to change colors. The first day, they're going to be black or two. Black and actually like tar and really, really sticky. This is called meconium. These are first bowel movements that all babies have. Um, the second or third day, it should start changing to kind of a greenish color. Uh, from the fifth day on, should be yellow, runny, and what we call seedy, meaning lumpy. This looks like diarrhea. If you have family members who have only fed formula to their babies and they see your baby's diapers, they're going to tell you your baby has diarrhea. This is not diarrhea. This is normal breast milk stool. When you see yellow, runny, seedy poop coming out of your baby, you can be cheering because you know that baby's getting breast milk, mature milk at that point. Uh, we've had babies even brought to the emergency room when the parents were told that was diarrhea and it turns out it was just breast milk stool. So please don't bring the baby to the emergency room just for a stool that looks like that because that's normal with breastfeeding. 
So like I said, after the mature milk is in, your breast should feel firm before feeding and softer after if the baby takes milk out. Should be here in swallowing. And the baby should not be showing hunger cues after a feeding. And remember we talked about the sucking motions, the sucking on their fingers, the squirming around, the banging the head, all that stuff. If your baby is, see, you think the baby's done feeding and you have clean finger, just touch their lips lightly. If they just stare at you, they're probably full. If you touch their lips and they go mm, like this, then they're not done and they need some more. So put them back in the first breast, put them on the second breast. I don't care, just feed them some more until they're not showing those hunger cues anymore. And then bottom line that the baby's getting enough will be that the baby gains weight. So you want to get your baby weight often, ideally every week or two for the first few um, months because you want to be sure that weight continues to go up and up and up. Um, that's how you know bottom line weight gain means your baby's getting enough food. Call us if you can't wake your baby or keep your baby awake for the 8 to 12 times of feedings every day, if your baby loses more than 10% of their birth weight, if the baby is not back to birth weight by about 10 days to 14, if your baby is not having enough wet and dirty diapers as we just talked about, or your baby or you have breast or nipple pain, please give us a call for any of those reasons or any other concerns that you have. We're here during the day. Uh, leave a message. If we don't an answer, we'll call you back as soon as we can. Now, um, the second night, remember I told you that the first day babies get quite sleepy. So often the first night they sleep a bit. Second night tends to not be like that. So I like to warn people that um, your baby might be sleepy the first night. Now, once in a while, we have babies who are awake all night the first night, but um, usually it's the second night where they just want to seem to feed and feed and feed and feed. And I used to work, um, I've been a nurse for 44 years. I used to work nights on mom baby. And I had many moms say to me, oh, I must not have enough milk because the baby just keeps eating and eating and eating and eating, so there must not be any milk there. Um, and then they asked for formula. Turns out this is a normal developmental process. Your baby, by about 24 hours, is starting to figure out they're separate from you and they miss you. And so they know when they're eating, you're going to be holding them. Uh, so they're going to get fussy and they're going to seem to want to eat constantly. And part of it is because of the first night. Maybe they didn't get all 8 to 12 feedings in in the first 24 hours, so they make up for it by eating like constantly. And it seems to be more at night for some reason. Um, babies don't know their nights and days. Up until they're born, they don't, can't see a difference. So um, you want to hold the baby a lot. You want to um, feed the baby frequently. So I encourage um, that dad or an, another support person stay the night with you in the hospital, for sure the second night, but all the nights if you can. Um, most times with the regular vaginal delivery, you're out of the hospital in two days for c-section usually three days um, and what I recommend is tag teaming it so mom you hold the baby and feed the baby and feed the baby and feed the baby while dad goes to sleep for a little while when you can't keep your eyes open anymore you wake him hand him the baby he holds the baby rocks the baby maybe does some skin to skin walks with the baby while you try to sleep for a couple of hours and when that doesn't work anymore, he wakes you and hands you the baby and he goes back to sleep. This tag team and back and forth at least gets everybody some sleep. Otherwise, nobody gets any sleep. Okay. So this is called cluster feeding and it occurs more on the second night and the third night and sometimes the fourth night. Um, and it's worse if you've had lots and lots of visitors. Now, currently we're limiting visitors, but um, too many visitors interfere with you getting your many feedings in during the day. The more you feed during the day, the sooner the baby will start doing some sleeping at night. So nutrition-wise, you need just an extra two to 300 calories a day. Make good choices, pick healthy foods, um, you can eat anything in moderation. Uh, I have coffee and cola up on the screen because 
you can have a little bit of caffeine. If you like caffeine coffee, you can have a cup in the morning. I wouldn't drink the whole pot, moderation, remember, but you can have um, a cup. The coffee or the, the cola is fine once a day. Again, don't drink the whole 12 pack, but you can have one and see how it goes. Now you can try two and see if your baby gets all wired and jittery, then go back to one. But most babies will tolerate one pretty well. And please continue your prenatal vitamins. Um, vitamin D is the only thing that's ever been found to be short in breast milk. And that is because most of us women, uh, anybody who lives in this part of the world, north of, say, Atlanta, Georgia, doesn't get enough sunshine in our daily life to absorb enough vitamin D. You can't, it's really, really difficult to get enough from food alone. So because most of us are short of vitamin D, you can't possibly put enough in the milk if you don't have it for yourself. Some studies are being done about maybe we should be giving moms more vitamin D. There is some in your prenatals. Um, but the current standard is to, sup, to give the baby some vitamin D drops. And you can drop it into their mouth once a day, or you can drop it on your nipple and have them breastfeed and get it that way. Either way is fine. Um, your pediatrician uh, or family doctor for the baby will probably recommend that, and that is perfectly appropriate. Everything else is in the breast milk, and it would be if we got more sunshine in, in our baby's breast milk, too. So the first few weeks, I've said it over and over, I want you to really understand this, are the most intense part of breastfeeding. They're the most difficult. And the baby's going to be feeding often. Your baby's going to eat a lot. You're going to spend a lot of your time feeding the baby. Um, when I s come to the room, if I see you the day you go home from the hospital, if you're here, um, I will probably uh, tell you to hold the baby a lot, feed the baby a lot, eat food yourself, and get as much rest as you can. If you do nothing else in the first couple weeks, you're doing amazing things for the breastfeeding. Um, accept help from others. If you have people offering to get you some meals or do some laundry for you, things like that, errands for you, it's awesome. Uh, rest as literally as much as you can. Sleep when the baby is sleeping because you're going to be up at night. Your baby is growing at such a fast rate. Your baby's going to double their birth weight usually by about five to six months and triple it by a year. That's an amazing amount of growth when you think about it. That's why they need to eat so often. I want to uh, read you some of the laws that relate to breastfeeding. In Illinois, I've got Illinois laws. I'm sorry I don't have the Wisconsin ones on me, but they're pretty similar. It's, uh, the law says that a mother may breastfeed her baby in any location, public or private, where the mother is otherwise authorized to be, irrespective of whether the nipple of the mother's breast is uncovered during or incidental to breastfeeding. In other words, no one can kick you out of anywhere for breastfeeding your baby. If you are, you know, once all the restrictions are lifted, if you're in the middle of a shopping mall, you can sit down and feed your baby. Um, you can feed your baby in a restaurant, things like that. Um, they cannot kick you out of anywhere for breastfeeding, so you need to be aware of that. And in Illinois, any mother nursing her child shall upon request be excused from jury service. Not much gets you out of jury duty anymore, but if you're breastfeeding and they call you to jury duty, you just give them a call and say, by the way, I'm breastfeeding, and they'll say, okay, we'll call you later. They just don't want babies in the courtroom. That's fine. Let's just stay home. Last time I was there, there must have been 200 people in that room. They'll be fine without you. Then in Illinois, the law for a break time for nursing mothers states that an employer shall provide reasonable break time each day to an employee who needs to express breast milk for her nursing infant child each time the employee has need to express milk for one year after the child's birth. The break time may run along with any other break time already provided to the employee. An employer may not reduce an employee's compensation for the time used for the purpose of expressing milk or nursing a baby. An employer shall provide reasonable break time as needed by the employee unless to do so would create an undue hardship. And they have to actually apply um, to say that the 
there it's really going to affect the workflow and pretty much only gets granted to people from really small employers like maybe two or three or something where you couldn't be away so most of the time most jobs are going to to give you time and a place now that was uh, from July of 2018 that law was updated and I think they read the national law because you'll hear some familiar things. As of 2010, in the whole United States, employers are required to provide reasonable break time for an employee to express breast milk for her nursing child for one year after the child's birth, each time such employee has the need to express the milk. Employers are also required to provide a place other than a bathroom that is shielded from view and free from intrusion from co-workers and the public which may be used by the employee to express breast milk. I love how that's worded. Um, and by the way, a bathroom is not an appropriate place to pump milk. Think about it. Would you want your meals prepared in a public bathroom? Ew, probably not. So um, you don't want to be preparing your baby's meals there either. So a room with an outlet for your breast pump, most electric pumps will need to be plugged in. Um, some run on batteries, but some of the batteries uh, do wear down pretty quickly. So if you have an opportunity to plug in your breast pump, you always want to do that. Um, so those are the laws. Now I want you to start practicing with your pump about six weeks before you're going back to work. Unless you're going back to work in six weeks, then four weeks is good. Um, pumping is different than breastfeeding. You're going to be needing to learn to relax to get that pump um, to work for you. Um, it's easy to relax when you're cuddling your baby. It's hard to relax with a machine attached to your chest. So it's something that's going to take, it's a learning curve for some people. Some people have to take a little time to, to figure this out. The more you relax when you pump, the more that comes out. So I do definitely recommend that like once a day for the last four to six weeks before you go back to work, if you're going to work or school or something where you're going to be away from the baby, that you sit down with your pump once every morning and pump for 20 minutes if you're pumping both breasts at the same time. You'll get a little bit of milk at first. A lot of times you don't get much. I have gotten some panicked phone calls from moms. I just pumped for the first time, I only got a half ounce, oh my gosh, that's all the baby's getting. No. What the pump gets is not what the baby's getting, okay? A well-feeding baby will almost always get more milk than a pump. And if the baby's growing and, and doing well, baby's getting more than that. Uh, but like I said, it's that learning to relax and, and enough that your, your pump will work for you. Um, a number one key that I always tell moms about pumping is don't just stare at the things. You put those pieces on your breast and you just sit there and look at them. When you're doing that, this little voice in your head is going to say, where's the milk? Where's the milk? And Because it doesn't come out right away. And you're going to get all tensed up and the more tense you get, the less milk that comes out. So look away. Um, watch TV. Listen to music. Do something besides staring at these things. If you find you can't stop looking, put something over you to cover it so you can't look. Um, really makes a difference in how much milk you get out. So relaxing, listening to music. Like I said, um, there was a study done recently where they had a group of moms listen to music, another group not listen to music. Those who listened to music got more milk and it was higher in fat than the moms who weren't listening to music. Well, that's easy. Doesn't cost anything if you have music on your phone, just play it and see if that helps you get more milk out too. Okay, so for some milk storage tips, I want to go through a few of those with you. And when you're he um, here in Rockford anyway, um, you will get a book that's going to have this, all this information in it after your babies are born. Um, Mom, breast milk that is freshly pumped or expressed is good at room temperature up to about four hours. So if for some reason you're going to use it right away, you don't even need to put it in the refrigerator. You can just leave it in the bottle on the counter or whatever. It's freshly pumped milk is good in the refrigerator up to four days. It's good in the freezer 
for six months or up to 12 months if you're using a deep freeze, like a chest or an upright that's only a freezer. But ideally, you'd want to use it within six months if possible. Now, once milk has been frozen and you thaw it, and I'm going to talk about how to do that in a minute, then it is good for one to two hours at room temperature, up to 24 hours in the refrigerator, and they don't recommend refreezing once it's been thawed. And then once a baby has been drinking from a bottle of breast milk or formula, if after two hours the baby has not finished it, the rest must be thrown away because the baby's saliva mixes with it and it can get contaminated. So you want to be sure that your baby drinks it within two hours. So the hint to that is don't put too much in the bottle. It's better to put a couple of ounces in the bottle and then after the baby finishes, if the baby wants more, you can always put a little more in there. But if you're always putting four ounces and the baby's only drinking two, then you're going to be wasting a lot of it. And you work too hard to pump breast milk to waste it. Okay. At work, you want to put the milk into a cooler with ice packs or into a refrigerator. And from personal experience, um, put it in a bag of some kind because people get freaky about breast milk. Oh, it's breast milk. You know, it's not a biohazard. It's nothing wrong. It's food for your baby. Uh, but just to save a lot of arguments, stick it into like a lunch bag or a brown bag or something so they don't know what's in it. Um, Milk can be stored in glass or in BPA-free plastic. BPA is a ca cancer-causing chemical that leaches into the milk um, or whatever's in the bottle. And it was in baby bottles up to the early 2000s. So I don't recommend buying baby bottles like off Craigslist or at a garage sale or something like that because you might get some of those older bottles that I have BPA in them. Anything you buy now is very clearly going to say on the labels BPA free. Um, and all the breast pump parts are BPA free as well. Milk storage bags are okay to use as well. They're little like specially made for milk, have a little Ziploc-y kind of top on them. You don't want to, um, it's to just throw that in the fridge or freezer, I would recommend that you put several small bags in a bigger Ziploc bag to put in the freezer. One, because an ounce or two may get pushed to the back of the freezer and you may not find it. Or um, if there's a pinhole in the packaging or in your, um, in your milk bag, then the packaging bacteria in the food in the freezer might get into your baby's milk. So you want to double bag those uh, milk storage bags. Always date any milk you put in the refrigerator or freezer so you know how long it's been there so that you can um, compare it to what the guidelines are. Okay. So when you're pumping, you want to pump after or between feedings. And by the way, your breasts are never truly empty. Okay. You're making milk while it's being removed. So I've had lots of moms say, well, I don't know when to pump because the baby might wake up and knee deep. It's okay. If you pump some milk out and the baby wakes up, there's already more milk there for the baby. Okay. When at work, ideally, you'd pump every three hours. And I do understand that not all work situations are going to uh, accommodate that. But three to four hours um, would be the, the recommendations. And then be sure you're breastfeeding often when you are home, evenings, weekends, whatever you're not at work. Um, because many women do have a little dip in their supply when they go back to work. So you want to be sure that you're um, breastfeeding frequently at home to kind of keep that up. Medical insurance should cover a breast pump for you, a personal use breast pump. Um, some insurances will let you get it before the babies are born. Others make you wait till your baby's born. Um, some make you go through certain durable medical equipment suppliers. Um, but contact your insurance about that, or we have some information, too, in the office. These are five different types of breast pumps. I'm not supporting or endorsing any particular pump. But I like these pumps because they have the ability to be usable for any any woman. Some breast pumps come with only one of this, this we call the flange, the shield that goes on the breast, and it has to fit your nipple size, not your breast size, but your nipple size. 
And if it fits, the ones that only come in one size, you're fine. But if it doesn't, it's a totally useless piece of equipment. All five of these companies make different size pieces that you can switch out should you need to do so. In fact, a couple of them come with two sizes initially. Um, because not everyone's the same size nipple. So this is an Ardo. We don't see a whole lot of Ardos, but it's a good pump. This is a Hygia. This one's Medela. That's a Spectra. And this is the um, Amida Maya pump. Uh, all good pumps for individual use. Uh, they do wear out over time, so if you're like only pumping all the time, uh, at some point they do wear out. Uh, so for a future child you might need a different one. Uh, but these are all good pumps and uh, again some insurances give you choices of what kind you can get, others do not. So, uh, you need a good quality pump. You need one that fits properly. Um, you need to center the nipple right in the middle of the flange, this piece here. So, it needs to be right in the middle here because as the pump is going, this is a, a manual or hand pump, um, it's going to draw the nipple and the breast tissue in. And you want to be sure the nipple can move without rubbing. You also don't want too much of the breast tissue to be moving in there either. So that's why it can be too big or too small. Of the electric pumps, there'll be a knob or a button or something that's going to adjust how hard it sucks. You want to use the highest comfortable pressure. Okay, You have control over that. You can adjust it. I want you to inch it up a little at a time. If it gets pinchy or uncomfortable, please turn it back to the la down to the last place it was comfortable. And that's where you should be pumping. Okay. Um, using more pressure does not get you more milk. You are not sucking milk through a straw. You're moving milk from a breast. It's a whole different thing. So you want the highest that's comfortable. If it's hurting, turn it back down some more. You don't get more milk with more pressure. We actually get less sometimes because it hurts. And then you tense up. Store the milk in two to four ounce amounts in the beginning. Um, in those first few months, some babies take two, three, or four ounces out of feeding. Um, better, like I said, that you have a two ounce amount that can be fed to the baby if the baby wants more, then add some to it than to always have like all four ounces and then you're throwing half of it away. Okay. These are milk storage bags. And that's just a milk storage bottle. Now, never, ever, 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 have I said that enough times, put breast milk in a microwave. Microwaves cause hot spots that can burn babies, and they actually kill some of the good living cells that are in the breast milk. So it makes the milk not as good. So never put breast milk in a microwave, and be sure that any of your caregivers who are caring for your baby, daycare providers, sitters, family members, know, do not put that breast milk in the microwave. And also, don't cook it on the stove. Don't boil water and stick it in there. Just take a bowl or cup of hot tap water, set your bag or bottle of milk into it on the counter, and let it sit for a few minutes. If it's just been in the refrigerator, it's going to be ready in a couple of minutes. If it's frozen, you may need to change the water a couple times to more hot water, but not boiling water, just warm out of the tap. Okay? If your baby is premature or sick or needs to go to the neonatal intensive care unit, breast milk's even more important for those babies. Babies who get breast milk in the NICU get out of there sooner and have fewer complications. So um, it's really important for our NICU and our NICU doctors and are very supportive of, of providing breast milk to the babies. Um, now, we will have you starting some hand expression and pumping within the first couple of hours of your baby being born. And we will need you to pump 8 to 12 times every 24 hours, same as your baby would feed, in order to get that good milk supply established. We have hospital pumps. Uh, the NICU has pumps in every baby's room that you can use when you're visiting and then use your personal pump at home. Um, 
So we'll want to be sure before you leave the hospital that you do have a pump to you so you can continue your pumping routine. To get 8 to 12 pumpings in every day, I encourage you to try to pump every two hours while you're awake and then at least every four hours while you're sleeping and you get little stretches of sleep. You do need to pump sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. because that's when your hormone levels are the highest and that will help you get in more milk too. Okay. So, skin to skin, have I said that enough times? <laughs> and breastfeed and labor and delivery. You want to hold your baby skin to skin a lot. It's just never the wrong thing to do. It's always going to help. Uh, be sure you're feeding 8 to 12 times, that you are tracking your feedings. Now, you can do that on pencil and paper. You can do it with a breastfeeding app on your phone. There are a whole bunch of breastfeeding apps out there. A lot of them are free. Um, and track the wets and the poops as well in the beginning. Um, as well as the feeding so that you can count and be sure you're getting eight feedings every day. Now one word of caution about breastfeeding apps is that some of them are put out by formula companies and they will throw little things at you that you need to give some formula now. If your baby needs formula, your baby's doctor or one of us will tell you that, please don't go by what the app says. But you can use their apps just for tracking if you want to. Alright, keep the baby nearby, hold the baby a lot. Um, avoid bottles and pacifiers for the first four weeks. Just a review. Um, in Rockford, uh, the consultants, we are here seven days a week. We have great references for medications, resources if you are taking a medication and you're not sure it's okay for breastfeeding or a doctor prescribes it for you and tells you you can't breastfeed and take it or the pharmacist tells you you can't breastfeed and take it please call us to confirm because there are medicine references that say all medicines are bad for breastfeeding. We have references where they've actually done studies. If a mom's on the medicine, how much gets in the milk? How much gets in baby's bloodstream? And then you can decide based on accurate, up-to-date, evidence-based information if, if it's, you know, because not all medicines are good. Not all of them are bad. Some are okay. They don't get in the milk in very good quantities. They're not absorbed by baby, different things like that. Uh, we have outpatient clinic. Every uh, mom who delivers at any of the hospitals, if they want to, can come to our outpatient clinic if you need some help with breastfeeding or need some reassurance after you're dismissed from the hospital. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. And that phone number was up there. Uh, we have a breastfeeding support group, which is temporarily suspended due to the um, COVID-19 crisis but uh, hopefully we'll get that up and rolling again in a few months once that uh, crisis has passed. But it was meeting every Wednesday morning from 10 to 11 and we'll resume uh, at some point. It'll be on our, the hospital website when it resumes. And it's up on the fourth floor of Riverside Hospital. No registration needed, you just drop in whenever you want. Again, that's currently not yeah, being utilized. But in our outpatient clinic, um, you just call and schedule an appointment. That does require a scheduled appointment with one of us. And then you bring the baby ready to feed, and we weigh the baby and have you feed and weigh the baby after. We can tell you how much that baby's taken at a feeding, which even if everything's going well is a nice thing to hear. Um, we can address any concerns with the latching and the feeding and all that. Currently no charge for the appointment, um, baby will be weighed, like I said, feedings assessed. Any concerns will be addressed. So remember, the longer you breastfeed your baby, the easier it gets, and the more benefits you and your baby will receive. Breastfeeding is not just about food, it is about nourishing and comforting your baby. Both are equally important to your baby. The newborn has but three demands. They are warmth in the arms of its mother, food from her breast, and security in the knowledge of her presence. Breastfeeding satisfies all three. Dr. Grantley Dick Reed said that sometime in the middle of the 20th century, when breastfeeding wasn't very common. Breastfeeding is a mother's gift to herself, her baby, and the earth. That's Pamela K. Wiggins. She's part of the Lala Chili. We look forward to seeing you uh, in the hospital. This picture is my best picture of a milk drunk baby. Look at the eyes of that baby. That baby's just going. 
When babies are hungry, they tend to have concerned looks on their faces and tight little fists. And when they get full, they just go, they get limp. Their hands aren't quite so white knuckle tuck. And they get that glassy eyed look on their faces. You will learn that look on your baby's face, that baby's full. Okay. I have a video that um, I'd like you to watch next because you actually get to see some people breastfeeding. Not unusual for people to uh, be in my classes and not have ever actually watched somebody breastfeed up close. They're not all using the world's best positioning. There are a couple of emotional ladies in there, but it's a good video and I really encourage you to stick around and, and watch that. And uh, please call us again if you have any questions, 815-971-5020. Thank you very much. Finding out I was pregnant was probably one of the best days of my life. Have you ever done anything this amazing in your whole life? Ever touched skin this soft? Ever seen anything as tiny and perfect as those little fingers and toes? You did this. For nine months, you've been making a miracle. You even made eyelashes. And your decision to breastfeed your baby will continue the brilliant work you've already done because breastfeeding is the single most important step you can take to ensure your baby's continued growth health, and well-being. Breast milk is, quite simply, nature's most perfect food. And breastfeeding does more than anything else to bond you and your baby for a lifetime. Breastfeeding is the very heart of mothering, the way nature wants you to keep taking care of your baby. For thousands and thousands of years, mothers and grandmothers, sisters, aunts, cousins, and girlfriends have shared the common bond of breastfeeding. And now, you can benefit from and contribute to their collective wisdom and experience. The thing about a woman's body is that it is made to, to be this really powerful kind of machine. And it's really able to do so much to create a baby, to support the baby. The baby's living inside you and you don't even realize all the things that are happening and the things that your body is doing to help grow this baby every day um, from kind of nothing into a person. For the rest of your lives, you and your baby will never spend a more important hour together than the very first one after birth. And by together, we mean skin to skin and heart to heart. This immediate contact does amazing things for both of you, physically and emotionally. It relaxes you and helps you both start to recuperate after all the hard work you've just done. Most importantly, it begins the bond between the two of you that will last a lifetime. And for most moms and newborns, it sets the stage for an amazing phenomenon called the breast crawl. The fact is that babies come into the world already knowing how to breastfeed, which is why so many people now talk about baby-led breastfeeding. More often than not, when a healthy newborn is laid skin to skin on mom's belly, within an hour, and often much sooner, this tiny, seemingly helpless little person begins moving towards his mother's breast. He's moving instinctively, using smell and feel to get where he wants to go, where he needs to go. As he begins to move, your instincts will probably be to help him, to cuddle and hold and guide him as he makes his way. And that's fine. But the truth is, even if you don't help, he'll most likely find your breast all by himself. Even more remarkably, when he finds it, he'll know exactly what to do. Most babies seem to arrive knowing that mom's breast is not only the source of all the nourishment they need, but of safety and security. 
For all kinds of reasons, at the very beginning of life, your breast is the most important place in your baby's world, and he knows it. It's where he's meant to be. But if your baby doesn't breast crawl or doesn't do so right away, don't worry. The breast is more important than the crawl, so no matter how he gets there, he still knows what to do. Throughout your pregnancy, your body has been preparing to breastfeed, so when baby arrives, you already have a supply of early milk or colostrum, a rich, thick, yellow substance that you may have noticed during the last weeks of pregnancy. You won't have a lot of colostrum, you don't need a lot, but it's perfectly formulated for newborns. Colostrum helps build baby's immune system and protects his fragile intestinal tract. But baby's not the only one who's benefiting. Your first feedings release hormones in your body, including oxytocin. Some people call it the cuddle hormone because that's what it makes you want to do. Cuddle and snuggle with your baby. And that, in turn, helps both of you to relax. Colostrum gives way to transitional milk, what baby gets during the first week of life, and then mature milk. Every drop is a custom blend designed specifically for your baby. Just as no two babies are alike, neither is the milk their mothers make for them. You are delivering exactly what your baby needs, exactly when he needs it. That's because your breast milk is constantly changing to meet your baby's changing nutritional needs. Not just every week or every day, but every feeding. As each feeding progresses, your milk gradually changes from thinner, thirst-quenching milk at the beginning to a thicker milk loaded with fats at the end of the feeding that helps satisfy your baby's appetite. It's as though he starts with skim milk and then gets a little 1%, 2%, whole milk, half and half, and finally, heavy cream. There's nothing like it. There's, there's nothing like knowing that I am the only person that can do that with her. Yes, I grew her, and I was the only person who could do that, but nobody else can sustain her like I can. Breast milk has so much good stuff in it, we don't have time to tell you about all of it. In fact, researchers think there may be more good stuff in breast milk than they even know about. But we do know that breast milk protects your baby from many serious illnesses. And we know that breastfeeding moms are at lower risk for breast cancer. What's more, this miracle food is absolutely delicious. Ask any baby. It's easy to digest. It's always at the perfect temperature. And the manufacturer, that's you, should have plenty of inventory. But best of all, nature's most perfect food, which you couldn't duplicate at any price, is absolutely free. For the first several weeks of your baby's life, the two of you will probably spend more time breastfeeding than any other single activity, except, hopefully, sleeping. Nature designed it that way because lots of breastfeeding helps you build your milk supply and gives you and your baby the time to get to know each other. In just a few days, your baby will recognize your face, your voice, the way you feel and smell. And just as baby knows your voice, you'll know your babies. That old wives' tale about being able to tell the difference between baby's cries, I'm wet, I'm hungry, I'm tired. It's absolutely true. And breastfeeding is the primary way you and your baby learn about each other. Hi, Mom. Hi, kid. What's new? Everything. If we had to choose just one key for successful breastfeeding, that key would be comfort for both you and your baby. And the key to comfort is often calm. Before you breastfeed, if there's time, take a moment. Talk a little. Touch a little. Snuggle. You want to be present in mind, body, and spirit. Because when you're calm and collected, most likely your baby will be too. Of course, there will be times when this kind of check-in won't be realistic. 
The only thing you'll care about will be getting baby to the breast right now. But when you can, take a moment. Don't pass it up. Up until a few years ago, we made a very big deal about positioning for both you and your baby. Should you be sitting in a chair or reclining? If it's a chair, what kind of chair? Do you need a footstool? What about pillows? What's better, the cradle position or the cross cradle? The answer to all these questions is the same. Whatever works best for both of you. And any discussion of positioning should begin with a reminder of the most basic position of all. Laid back breastfeeding with baby leading the way. That means mom reclining at an easy angle, laid back, so your whole body is comfortable. Your baby lies on top of you with as much skin-to-skin -skin contact as possible. In this position, you don't have to do a thing because your body supports your baby completely and gravity does the rest. Your hands are free to touch and stroke and soothe. Then, either with the breast crawl, your assistance, or both, Baby will find your breast and your nipple and begin feeding. Even newborn mouths are amazingly strong, so the sensation of baby's first latch may be a bit of a surprise, but it shouldn't hurt, and if it does, usually a slight adjustment, a small change of baby's position will make things comfortable. As we've said, babies know how to do this. They know how to make a good latch, how to suck, they use every muscle in their faces. You may even see their ears wiggle. They know how to swallow. You may hear it when they do. How to take little breaks when they need to so they don't get too tired. They're already experts. Most of the time, all you have to do is let them do their thing. back position is the only way you and baby will want to breastfeed? Not at all. For a variety of reasons, at some point, you'll want to change things around. And that's where the other positions come in. One of the most popular positions is called the cradle hold. Baby's on his side, so the two of you are tummy to tummy with baby's head resting comfortably on your forearm with his head free to move. The crossover, or cross cradle, is like the cradle, except you hold the baby in the opposite arm and support your breast with the hand that's on the same side you're feeding from. There's also the clutch, or football hold, with the baby tucked under your arm instead of cradled in it. This position can be helpful after cesarean deliveries because it keeps the baby's weight away from the incision. Then there's the sideline position, which can be very useful for nighttime feedings. If you're planning to nurse your baby in your bed, this arrangement can eventually become almost automatic for the two of you and may provide you with more rest, especially during those early weeks together. When the two of you get good at nighttime feeding, it won't be uncommon for one or both of you to fall asleep. These other positions may require plenty of support to assure maximum comfort for both of you. So remember those pillows and footstools. You may also find that, regardless of position, some babies do better with a minimum of distraction. They like low light and minimal noise so they can concentrate on what they're doing. On the other hand, some babies can breastfeed in the middle of Times Square. Sometimes you never know. Breastfeeding, like the rest of parenting, is on-the-job training. It will take some time to figure out which positions work best for the two of you. 
You may use different positions at different times of the day, or even shift positions during one feeding. It doesn't matter. As long as both of you are comfortable and baby is well latched, there's no right or wrong here. Regardless of position, however, you need to be sure that baby's head is free to move and that the chin isn't tucked, which can interfere with a good latch and make swallowing difficult. The truth is that for most moms and babies, it doesn't take long for all of this to become second nature, something you won't have to worry about, even during those sleep-deprived early weeks and months of motherhood. Remember, Breastfeeding is the most natural thing in the world for both of you. But if things don't seem to be working quite right, remember how the two of you got started, comfortably laid back with baby leading the way. In this case, it's always okay to go back to square one. He got his little hand free from his blanket and rested his hand on my chest, and it was just the cutest little thing I've ever seen. And it just, it, that's when it really hit me that, that my body is, is what's going to make him grow, and my body is, is what nourishes him, and I made this little, little tiny human being. Made it, he was inside me, and, and he came out, and, and it's a little part of me, and he's gonna grow up. We've only been talking about moms and babies because breastfeeding is, of course, exclusively a mom and baby collaboration. So where does that leave your partner with the second most important job in your baby's world? Simply put, a partner's job is to nurture you so that you can nurture your baby. That can mean many things, ranging from burping, changing diapers, bathing, and dressing, to being the gatekeeper who keeps distractions and intrusions to a minimum, including taking care of your other kids if you have them. But your partner and your baby also need to bond. So playing, cuddling, comforting, taking the baby between feedings, staring in awestruck wonder at the person you've made, they're all in the job description too. And one more thing, partners, don't forget to tell mom what a great job she's doing. It makes a difference. My husband hates bananas. He's always hated bananas. Um, and when we had this new little baby and I was breastfeeding her every morning for breakfast, he braved the banana and made me a peanut butter and honey banana sandwich so that I would have something to eat to feed our baby and keep her healthy and happy. So far, we've made it sound like all you need to do is get a baby, get comfortable, and get started. And it's entirely possible that that's exactly what will happen. It's also possible that it won't. So here are some answers to a few of the most frequently asked questions, especially when you're just starting out. I knew my baby was hungry because she would start bobbing her head like this. Um, and whoever was holding her, she would start bobbing along their chest, or she would start turning her head to, to try to latch on to, um, you know, people's arms and shirts and everything else. Sometimes in the beginning it'll be sort of slow, like she's sort of moving back and forth, but then as time goes by, she doesn't get the breath, she starts doing this. He would do this in his sleep. <laughs> and grunting, I mean snorting, it's, it sounds like a little pig, actually. And um, I didn't realize it was going to sound like that. When they're really young, they'll, it looks like they're trying to eat their fists. They'll just put their hands and fists and stuff into their, their mouth and get a little fidgety. And then you know. And if you miss those cues, you know, your baby's going to start screaming and wailing. How great to see other mothers with their babies and seeing their babies doing the exact same thing. Um, and I was like, okay, we're all right. This is normal. I, I can 
see that satisfaction that my son had um, when he was nursing, when he'd just, he'd, he'd look at me and he'd be panicked initially until he latched on. And then the suction happened and then his eyes closed and he was just in a state of bliss. So she just starts to get distracted and like pulls away and looks away and arches her back and it's just, you know, everything becomes about, not about the boob. <laughs> Whereas when she's hungry, everything is about the boob. <laughs> when she's not hungry, everything becomes, everything around her becomes very interesting. Let's say this as simply as possible. No breast is too big or too small to breastfeed. And the same goes for nipples. Big, small, flat, inverted. There are ways to work around everything. And if your breasts are changing, it's because of pregnancy. It's not because of breastfeeding. It might have been the second day or the third day after she was born. And I called this one lactation consultant and she answered her phone at quarter to seven in the morning. And she talked to me for 45 minutes. That woman saved my life that day. I. Um, I was so grateful. And she just said to me, you know, it's it's gonna be okay, she's not gonna die. If you can't feed her, she's gonna be all right. You know, the first few days is, um, is mostly just for you both to rest and recover from the birth. And um, so don't, don't worry, it's gonna be all right. Thank God that woman answered her phone. Perhaps now is a good time to remind you that as a new mom, despite the way it may feel sometimes, you are never, ever alone. No matter what happens, no matter what problem arises, it's happened before and somebody knows what to do about it. Remember, as a breastfeeding mom, you're automatically enrolled in the world's oldest and largest support group. And while there are certain rare instances in which moms and babies cannot or should not breastfeed, for the vast majority of you, no matter what issues you're dealing with, the answers are out there. Some of the best places to look for them are international board-certified lactation consultants, the internet, and breastfeeding support groups, such as those found at your local chapter of La Leche League International. In fact, joining a support group is a great idea, even if everything is going just fine. You know all those moms you see hanging out with their little ones at the playground? Guess what they're talking about? Groups provide strength in numbers, kindred spirits, shoulders to lean on, and occasionally cry on, and ideas and answers by the thousands. And trust us, there will be thousands of questions as the weeks and months go by, most of which will have nothing to do with breastfeeding. The support that I got from my friends and family were like a big hug. So when I struggled and ch got challenges that were thrown my way and I was at my wit's end, I would just kind of go to one end of the circle and get a hug and get bounced back in, you know? It was, it was, because it was hard at times, but it was so nice to have this entire circle of, of friends and family who were there to support me, um, and not just to help with words, but actually experiences. Which brings us to another topic that may seem very far away right now, going back to work. But today, the majority of breastfeeding moms are also working moms, or in some cases, still in school. For a few lucky ones, baby will be welcome in the workplace, and breastfeeding can continue with only minor adjustments. But for most moms and babies, going back to work requires some pre-planning and learning some new skills. Starting with expressing and pumping your milk, followed by baby's transition to a bottle as well as your breast. For your baby, nursing from a bottle and nursing from your breasts can be very different. At first, some babies won't take a bottle from mom because they know the real deal is still available. So maybe your partner or a friend or relative will need to be the one who introduces the new delivery system. You'll also have to find out which way of pumping your milk suits you best. You have options ranging from hand expression to motorized breast pumps. 
often you'll find a combination of methods works best. Here again, lactation consultants and support groups and other working and nursing moms can be invaluable resources. The thing to remember is that whether you're there to deliver it in person or not, there is still nothing better for your baby than your milk. As special as breastfeeding is for both you and your baby, believe it or not, a day will come when you'll be ready to move on. Though it's relatively rare, a baby may decide to stop breastfeeding on her own. In other cases, whether due to circumstances or personal preferences, mom makes the decision. More often though, you and baby make the decision together. Please remember that the American Academy of Pediatrics strongly recommends at least one year of breastfeeding for your baby's long-term health, including breastfeeding exclusively for the first six months. After that, it's really just between the two of you. So where does that leave us? Maybe back where we started, with those perfect little fingers and toes, and those millions of mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, cousins, girlfriends, and other women who have breastfed their babies across thousands and thousands of years. They knew what you know, that there has never been anything more natural or nurturing in the world. Sorry. <laughs> When I nurse, it is the most amazing feeling next to giving birth to my son. To know that it's my body that nourished him for 40 weeks during the pregnancy and that I can continue to nourish him and that together he and I are growing and I am giving him what he needs to be a strong, healthy young man is like nothing I ever thought I would experience. And uh, <laughs> I wouldn't trade it for the world. I would never trade that for anything. <laughs>